Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Monday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. This is the show in which I celebrate artists and their body of worth. There are several layers to today's show because not only will I be celebrating uh, Ma and Pa Kettle on film uh, with Lon Davis, who I've had the pleasure of interviewing before on his previous book, uh, Deconstructing the Rat Pack. So from the Rat Pack to Ma and Pa Kettle, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of questions there. Uh, it's a dreary day here in New York City. And when it's a dreary day, what do I wanna do? I wanna go to the movies. And I especially want to escape. And that's what the Ma and Pa Kettle films are all about, escape. It's very interesting. And I'm gonna talk to Lon about this in a few moments. The other night I was watching Bill Maher and he did an incredible uh, closing monologue uh, about uh, the angst that we are seeing in our films right now. Think about this for a moment. During the 1940s, there was a whole series. There were 10 Ma and Pa Kettle films. It was all about escape. And today, I want all of you to escape for the next hour all of the trials and tribulations and everything that may be waiting outside your doors. But for now, we're going to go to the movies. And uh, we've got a great fi film series to get us there. Here's how it began. about August, we can begin to figure out more important offspring. Oh, darling. Maybe five or six hundred of them. Five or six hundred what? Well, chicks, of course. Starring Claudette Colbert, never so winsome. And Fred McMurray, never so delightful as the city couple tackling life in the raw in the wild Northwest. And wonderful Marjorie Maine and Percy Kilbride as Ma and Pa Kettle in the salty down-to-earth roles they created that made them the favorite of 50 million eager fans in The Egg and I. Henry, you hear what I say? Move over and give the lady a place to sit. Hi, Henry, Ma. I'm Albert. That's Henry over there, don't you remember? Wouldn't mind having a few of them too before us. Then fix them a bond, they'd have no time to get to town. Well, uh, go ahead, help yourself. It's real neighborly of you. Bob, we've got to get away from here before it's too late. They don't want us here. The mountains and the rain and the wind, they don't want us here. They're fighting us all the time. And there you are, Lon Davis. How are you? I'm great, Richard. How are you? It's good to see you again. It's been quite a year. Oh, yes, it has. It's so good to see you again, too. Well, thank you for reaching out and about this incredible book, which I have had so much fun reading. Um, you can't put it down because you really, um, well, you deconstructed the Rat Pack, but now you're deconstructing Ma and Pa Kettle. Um, I want to ask you, first of all, how you and your wife, Deborah, who worked on the book with you, are doing uh, in the midst of this time that we're living in right now. Oh, pardon me? I mean... I said, uh, how are you and your wife doing with everything? Oh, we're doing extremely well. I mean, uh, we haven't gotten our shots yet. For some reason, uh, it's slow here in Oregon. Um, the Pony Express... Uh, it doesn't work that well. And the, in fact, the pony's been a little sick lately, if you want to know the truth. 
but we don't think it's COVID. But what we do want to do is get our shots and uh, take away the angst, as you so beautifully described it earlier. Yeah, well, I got both of my shots. I got my last shot last Friday. Uh, no effects. I, I know some people are, are writing that they were feverish. They were all these other things, but nothing with me. I feel absolutely fine. So uh, I'm That's nice to know. Now, the last time that you and I sat here and talked, uh, you were with Rick Lertzman. Uh, you had written this amazing book, which I also have on my shelves. Um, are the dynamics the same working with someone like Rick as it is working with your wife on a project? They look very different, for one thing. Um, <laughs> aside, aside from that, they are both uh, excellent writers, uh, very dedicated to the subject, and very open to my ideas, just I'm, and I'm open to theirs, and it's a pleasure to work with both of them, absolutely. Before we delve into your process and the way that this book unfolded and everything, I'm reminded of another film that has absolutely nothing to do with these films, and that's It's a Wonderful Life. And I mentioned that film because um, it's all about the what ifs in a person's life. Uh, what if Betty McDonald's husband did not come to her and say, we're going to move and we're going to have a chicken farm. And she wrote a book that became a bestseller uh, and changed the trajectory, not only of their lives, but the lives of everyone else, including you and Deborah, now so many years later, writing this book. Why a book about Ma and Pa Kettle? Well, the truth is, I was going absolutely bonkers with uh, COVID uh, last summer. And I didn't have any standard where I'm a book editor and um, both of my publishing houses uh, stopped sending out uh, manuscripts because they said um, it's something to do with COVID. I have no idea how that fits because I do everything electronically, mm -hmm. but I was going nuts and you can only watch so much, um, you know, general hospital or whatever. So I started to, um, I thought of this book that Deb and I had conceived um, back in 1983, we were watching the Bond Paw Kettle films when we were living in our apartment then, and we thought they were very funny. And I said, you know, this would make a, a cute book. I figured in the past almost 40 years that somebody else would have thought that and come up with a book on them, but nobody ever has. Mm -hmm. So we thought, well, it's an unexplored topic, which is quite frankly, in the overstuffed field of film history, it's uh, hard to find a corner that hasn't been dusted, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So we, we thought, let's take on Ma and Pa Kettle. Well, last Sunday night, Sunday night a week ago, uh, uh, The Egg and I was shown on Turner Classic Movies once again uh, because we're leading up to the Oscars. And I was surprised, uh, I did not know this, that Marjorie Maine, of course, Ma Kettle, uh, was nominated for an Academy Award for this. Um, so before we get there, I want to back up for a moment. Uh, if you can, and a lot of this is in the book, we're not going to give away everything, everyone. We want you to buy the book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I want you to take our readers and our listeners back uh, to Betty McDonald uh, and her life. Um, I was really amazed reading your book again at all of the elements that were part of her life that ended up in the book itself and in the movie, uh, The Egg yes. and And well, let's start there and then we'll see where this takes us. Well, Betty McDonald was a very, kind of a happy-go-lucky person. She had a marvelous sense of humor and boy, did she need it because she had some situations in her life that were anything but funny. And one of those things that was particularly unfunny was her first marriage to a man named Bob Heskett. And they were so, well, she at least was so miserable in this uh, first marriage. She was a city girl. Well, I don't know if a city girl is the right thing, but she certainly wasn't used to working on a chicken farm, you know, and putting in long, miserable hours with a husband who was unresponsive and cold for the most part. And then when he got a couple of uh, shots of moonshine in him, he became downright abusive. Well, that is terrible. And only somebody with a superb sense of humor and a wonderful imagination could bring humor to a situation like that. And she did. Anybody reading her book would think, oh, what a romp, you know? And over a million people 
um, purchased that book in 1945, making it a huge bestseller. Everybody loved it. It was right after the war and people, it's just like everything with us, you know, everything from mm -hmm. our president, ex president to, to COVID to anything, the stock market, we all need a break. And, and we, we also, all, in addition to that, we need to find the humor in these situations. That's it. And quite frankly, that's not always easy to do, especially during these recent, really terrible times that we've lived in. And so I think the people thought after suffering through four years of war, um, you know, as far as America was concerned, they thought we're ready for something else. And it just turns out that this particular book was exactly right for its time. There was a genre of books at that time, which had individuals who were in out in nature and uh, loving, roughing it and stuff like that. And Betty McDonald thought, I, I, they, that's insane. Why would somebody do that if they didn't have to? Mm -hmm. And Deb and I can certainly relate to that philosophy ourselves. I've never understood the, the concept of camping or uh, whatever. I mean, who cares about that kind of thing? I like a warm bed and, you know, a, a cold scotch. But the, the thing about, you know, being with somebody like... Um, what the hell was I talking about? I start, I got myself distracted. I'm sorry. Well, well anyway, here's God the, will distract that's you right. every time. Yes, uh, I'm you sorry. That you were looking for the humor uh, that she, you know, and the time that the book came out and where the world was at that point. Yes, it was. It was. You're good. You're really good. <laughs> it when, like I said, everybody was sick of the war. This book was perfect escapism. And then, of course, they made a movie about it, which came out in 1947 which you just showed the trailer and it was. Well, let's back massive. up just a moment before we get sure. there. I mean, uh, this was her first book. She had never oh, yes. written this yes. before. Um, these stories also came out of the stories that she was sharing with her sisters and uh, her, uh, her family, uh, friends. And it was her sisters that really suggested that she turn this into a book. It's right. It's, there's always someone in your life, hopefully when you're a writer, encouraging you and saying, you need to put this down on paper. Well, she'd never written anything. Mm -hmm. That's how talented the woman was. She was not trained. She sat at her dining room table and looked back on these few horrible years that she spent in this miserable marriage on this crappy chicken farm. And she thought, um, I'm going to infuse this with some laughter and, and take some of the bad situations, maybe give them a little bit of a uh, you know, a little bit of a shine, as they say in vaudeville, and make it just a little bit more palatable than it actually was. And uh, she was successful at that. It was it was so successful that, quite frankly, it didn't bring her a lot of happiness. Mm -hmm. Being well known, uh, being wealthy, created their own problems, and she was. She had to face a lawsuit, as you would know from reading the book. Mm -hmm. She had to um, she had to contend with a lot of criticism from people who were perhaps jealous of her or whatever. And she often wished, I think, that she hadn't even done it in the first place. Mm -hmm. But she was such a natural writer that she continued. She wrote a book uh, after the Egg and I. One of the next books she wrote was called The Plague and I, mm -hmm. in which uh, she talked about her terrible battle with tuberculosis mm -hmm. and having to stay in a freezing cold institute institution for a well, year. You, know, you mentioned in the book, I mean, she was in a sanitarium uh, and we didn't have the antibiotics that we have now. Uh, so she suffered tremendously through tremendously. that. She had to lie there inert all day, 24 hours a day. She And uh, it, they say it was freezing and everything. But the amazing thing about even that is that she was making the orderlies and the nurses and the, her fellow patients laugh even when she was that hindered and it goes to show i think the power of the human spirit and especially the power of a good sense of humor it's something that gets us through the worst times obviously well obviously in the book um she talks about her neighbors on this farm uh with their brood of kids uh, yeah, which, of course, uh, gave birth to the Kettle family. That's it. Ma and Pa Bishop were the uh, family that lived near them. They had 13 kids. 
and their house was a mess and but they were welcoming people and they were they provided a respite for mm-hmm. Betty from her life of drudgery and as a result they were um sort of they became a comic inspiration they also became a nightmare because once the book came out uh they decided that they um had been ridiculed and they got a lawyer and they sued her mm-hmm. and unfortunately she was able to prevail mm-hmm. uh, under the under the auspices that she had not uh, mm-hmm. based the characters on these on these two individuals and their family but clearly she did and that is of course the birth of bond paul kettle absolutely now uh let's go back to the year that the film came out uh Universal Studios was going through major changes uh, and how things were, uh, people were let go. Uh, they were changing the direction. And also uh, Claudette Colbert and Fred McMurray had done a series of films together. Uh, if you can talk a little bit about what made them, first of all, a great screen team and what each of them brought to each other. They really did. I think Fred McMurray was sort of the perfect straight man. He. He was a guy who does, his characters always seem to be rather humorless and uptight. Claudette Colbert had more of a, oh, like a French pixie quality. She was, as they described her in that uh, trailer a minute ago, she was winsome. Not a word you hear a lot today, mm-hmm. but she was she was a, a, a delightful and beautiful person. I am so honored that I had the chance to actually meet Claudette Colbert and talked to her for a little while back in um, 1973. Mm-hmm. I was like 14 years old, and I was in a group of people, and uh, they were all elderly individuals, and it was right after a play she had performed, and suddenly this little um, girlish voice pipes up and says, I loved you in the egg and I, and she looked down, and she was only like four feet tall, but she towered over me, and she looked down, and she said, well, Thank you in the sweetest way possible. Well, I later heard Claudette Colbert really disliked the film The Egg and I, even though it was one of her biggest commercial hits. And there's wasn't a good this, reason. For uh, excuse me, but wasn't this her last major commercial hit? Yes, it was. It really was. Well, you have to remember, she had been around since um, the early 30s, and she was a glamour girl at that time playing Cleopatra. And she was a hot number. You also mentioned Frank Capra. Uh, she, of course, uh, she starred with uh, Clark Gable in uh, the marvelous uh, um, picture. It happened one night. It happened one night, mm-hmm. and uh, and of course she won an Academy Award for that. So did Gable. So did Capra. Well, um, that was her heyday. And then throughout the '30s, she started all of these marvelous uh, pictures, often for Paramount, I believe. And and into the 40s. Well, she started to um, show her age a bit, you know, when she made uh, when she made Mon, uh, Mon Pa Kettle, I, you know, the egg and I, I think she was close to being um, almost 50 years old. And that was supremely old for a leading lady at that time. She certainly carried the part off well, but she was, you might say she was past it. The fact that she was at Universal might even say that. Universal was kind of a bread and butter lot when it came to their Westerns and Abbott and Costello pictures and fun stuff. You know, it wasn't known as the serious studio. Tried to be, but it really didn't make it. And they, uh, so they, they, they tended to get various actresses who were on the far side of 40, you might say, and put them in films. And of course, the public um, loved it because they enjoyed her. But after that, the scripts stopped coming. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And and she might have looked at that as a time, not only that she was upstaged by Marjorie Maine, but uh, that she... Who goes on to get an Academy Award nomination. It, yeah, who gets an Academy Award nomination. And she's thinking, I'm past it. Nobody's mentioning me. And that's the unfortunate aspect of being an actor, I suppose. Well, you go into this in the book, but let's talk a little bit about the PR campaign uh, for the film. Uh, I know that they did uh, a Lux radio program. For those of you who do not know, uh, these were dramatizations that were put on the radio 
of these films, and they did that um, uh, with um, Elvia. Um, give me her last name. Uh, yes, uh, who did the Marjorie Main uh, role? Um, big uh, campaign uh, rollout from the studios. Um, the film opens, and it's a huge surprise for a lot of people. It was a tremendous hit. I don't think they had a lot of uh, faith in it. It was not a high budget film. Mm -hmm. um, it was not a, a serious or important vehicle. It was a popular vehicle. And it's something that was built in because there were so many people who loved the book and naturally they loved the film. The film was was beautifully cast, mm -hmm. uh, starting with Fred McMurray and, and Claudette Colbert. And of course, the marvelous Percy Kilbride and Marjorie Maine who were so vivid in those roles that they just, even though they were only on screen for 21 minutes during the course of that film, they stole the picture, just stole it. And they became so big that Universal decided to star them in their own series mm -hmm. of low budget B pictures that frankly, outgrossed some of the biggest A pictures that were being made in the late 40s and early 50s. Well, I'm going to bring up another trailer. This is one of the other Mon Pa Kettle films, and we'll talk about this on the other side. Hello, everybody. Howdy. We hope you can see our next picture when Pa and I go to town. New York town, that is. For well, the most fun we've ever had. And audiences went crazy everywhere. <laughs> um, again, in this incredible book, everyone, Mom, Pa, Kettle on Film, you really give us a background of both Marjorie Maine and Percy Kilbride and their history. Uh, let's start uh, with Marjorie Maine, um, who interestingly enough, just two days ago was the anniversary of her passing. Um, we're just two days off of celebrating her. Um, April uh, 1975. Yeah, she was so um, beloved at MGM, had a phenomenal film career. Uh, but if you can just tell us some of the things that surprised you uh, in terms of your research on her. Well, Marjorie Maine is a person that you you believe that she was a, uh, essentially a farm wife, uh, somebody who had no sense of fashion, uh, who had poor grammar, uneducated. Nothing could have been further from the truth. She was a brilliantly, um, she was a classically trained stage actress who specialized in Shakespeare. And she was also a teacher, an acting teacher. She was a um, very learned woman, um, extremely professional to the nth. And she was very traditional in her approach to uh, re researching a part and rehearsal and doing everything that you can. She read the novel of the egg and i something like a dozen times straight through and then she read the script that many times putting various emphasis on certain lines and not on others playing some scenes more broadly and others more subtly making her a rounded character not a caricature and she truly was great as you said she was at mgm mm -hmm. where she was always cast as it seems like a cook or a maid, you think of a film like um, Meet Me in St. Louis, and so Harvey, many other. Uh, Harvey Girls. Harvey oh, Girls, uh, Summer Stock, all marvelous Judy Garland pictures. And she was magnificent in those films. And you would think, oh, this woman must be the greatest cook and the uh, most kid-friendly <laughs> individual who ever lived. Once again, just the opposite. You mm -hmm. know, she was... Um, not big on kids, she never had any. And uh, she was extremely germophobic. And as a result, 
being around kids, it's like she would say about her own kettle kids. You never know what these kids are carrying, you know, <laughs> and she would have fit in very well today because she did walk around wearing a surgical mask. Mm -hmm. um, when she talked on the phone, she always had one. She wore gloves. She never shook someone's hand. She washed her own hands constantly throughout the day. I guess you would say um, if she had been diagnosed today and say she had obsessive compulsive disorder. And she, and of course, not, not having the benefit of medication at that time, it must have been hell. She was a woman who also had various health issues, um, you know, severe sinus condition and severe uh, bladder problems. And she had her issues, mm -hmm. but she always was there sick or well. She was there and giving 100% of herself to every performance. Percy Kilbride, by the same token, another intelligent individual, he too, between them, this is incredible, between them, when they started the Kettle Films, they they had a um, hundred years of experience between them. Mm -hmm. Each of them had celebrated their 50th year in show business, I think by the early 50s. And they had appeared in hundreds of plays, movies, uh, serious films, dramas, um, some comedies, of course, as we discussed, musicals, whatever. They did it all. But they were so experienced and so good, and they liked each other tremendously. Percy Kilbride was another rather introverted individual. He did like people, and he loved talking to his uh, the crew members and other actors. I've had nice stories that actors have told me about what it was like to work with him and the, the pleasant and funny things he would do and say. He was a man of great humor and um, and a great listener and a great uh, raconteur. And I think that really he was um, just a wonderful person and he greatly respected Marjorie Maine and Marjorie Maine had infinite respect for him as well. And they have this incredible chemistry together. Of course, she's so bombastic yes. and she's so laid back and laconic. Um, yes. But when you look at uh, film teams, people will think of Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn, Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney, um, Clark Gable, Myrna Loy. Um, it's very rare that you would see this couple on those lists, and yet they did a body of, uh, as I call it, a body of worth um, that is really worthy, um, pardon the pun, um, of being celebrated. And thank God you and Deborah have chosen to do that. Well, I, I feel privileged to have been able to be a part of this. I'm, I don't know why it um, hadn't been done. I seriously don't. Their films, if you look them up on, uh, on Amazon, there are thousands and thousands of reviews for their videos and uh, DVDs. Tremendous sellers. I hope the book um, emulates a little bit of that, at least. Mm -hmm. I dare say a lot of people would rather watch Bon Paul Kettle than read about them. But for those of us who were interested in show business, especially of another era and the backgrounds of people and what people were really like and what went into making the films, what were the, where did the stories come from? Everything, the writers, the supporting actors, everything, quite frankly, was top drawer mm -hmm. in the Kettle films. B movies, notwithstanding, they were incredibly well-made, well, carefully made, really lovingly made. Yes, yes. Uh, as you're writing the book, um, what was, was there a Holy Grail interview for you? Uh, obviously a lot of the people that were involved in those films are no longer uh, with us, unfortunately, uh, but they're still on film. Uh, so was there one particular interview that you were after and when, where, and how did that come about? when you achieve that goal? Well, my first uh, desire was to reach out to Lori Nelson. And you're very familiar with her, obviously. She was in a lot of universal pictures, like the Creature movies. And, you know, she was a, a, a lovely young lady. And she was made a star by these B pictures that she was in. And she appeared in two only of the Kettle films. But I associated her so much with the role of Rosie, mm -hmm. uh, the Kettle's eldest daughter. I thought I would love to get in touch with her. 
I managed to track down her husband. And it, he told me, sadly, that Lori would love to have been interviewed for the book, but she had Alzheimer's right. and she was completely uh, immobile, uh, unable to communicate in any way. And indeed, she was on hospice when I talked to her husband, who was a wonderful, wonderful man, a retired police chief. And he doted on her and adored her. And that was a very touching mm -hmm. interview. He told me all of the stories that she had told him over the years about what it was like to work with Marjorie Maine and Percy Kilbride. Frankly, she was a little bit intimidated by Marjorie Maine. Marjorie had a gruff voice. And apparently, Lori Nelson grew up in a quiet house, something I can't imagine. And uh, as a result, of course, she was nervous whenever Marjorie would raise her voice or act in a raucous manner. She was very comfortable with Percy Kilbride, on the other hand. the other, Another person who played an eldest child was Brett Halsey. Mm -hmm. And he's an actor that if you saw his photo, you'd think, oh, I've seen him in a hundred things, everything from... Uh, I don't know, you know, whatever, anything you can think of from the early 60s, late 50s, handsome, handsome guy. Mm -hmm. We well, got a start in Mon Pa Kettle at Home playing uh, Elwin, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he was excellent in the role. He went on to have a great career and he is thankfully still with us. He's in his late 80s, I believe, and an outstanding novelist. He sent me a couple of his novels to read. We had a great connection, so much so that I asked if he would mind writing the foreword to the book. And being a writer and uh, being a good one, he got it done quickly and got it to me. And it, that's nice. Sometimes you have to wait for months and months to get a forward from somebody you know or a few lines or whatever. But uh, he came up with something right away, was very enthusiastic about the project and had nothing but the best memories of working on that film. And I talked to, I think, in all five of the original Kettle Kids, you know, the people who had, were now in their 80s, 70s and 80s, late 70s. Yeah, I know, I know. And they all <laughs> had very vivid memories of what it was like to work in those pictures and how standoffish Marjorie was and, how friendly Percy was and how, you know, she didn't want to even look at the kids, didn't want to shake their well, hands. That's the dynamic of many households. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, exactly, I'm sure yes. Clip, and then I want to read something from your book. Uh, we'll be uh, back in just a second. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, step right up. Tell you what I'm gonna do. Watch. <laughs> For your delight, glee, pleasure, and entertainment, we present that salty, crusty, down to earth, and lovable, 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 lovable couple, Marjorie Maine. Whoa, Emma! Get that thing out of the way! And Percy Kilbride, just a streak of grease light. In my park kettle at the fair. It's their newest family laugh fest, full of more zip and zowie than any fair you ever thrilled to. One ice cream soda and 13 straws. Sure wish we had another horse to take her place. It ain't easy pulling that plow across the field. You're not as young as you used to be, Mom. Oh! 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 It's usually your nose. It's another people's business. Oh, dear. Paul, you're under arrest. Anything you say will be held against you. Under arrest? That's right. I didn't do anything, and if I did, I'm not guilty. Get out of Come on, Emma. Come on, Emma. Emma, we're a little behind.
And I have to say, this is my favorite out of the entire series. That's why is that I- right? Yeah. It's, it was the most profitable of the entire series and uh, one of the best remembered. It really, the series reached its peak with Vaughn Paul Kettle at the fair, no question. Now, do you have a favorite out of- I do. I like um, a couple of different ones. I really love the one you had shown earlier, Mon Paul Kettle Go to Town. I was from upstate New York. And as a kid, I always thought that nothing could beat the idea of going to the city, the big city. And watching Ma and Paul Kettle do that and those adventures they had was uh, very thrilling to me. I just love that picture. It's also got such wonderful writing um, and great, great lines of dialogue and some of them corny and a lot of them very subtle and uh, extremely clever. That was, that's probably, and the other one I think is Mom Pa Kettle at Home, mm -hmm. which is a more sentimental picture, almost a comedy drama in a sense with, uh, that's the film that I mentioned with Brett Halsey. And it also stars a great character actor whom you are familiar with, Alan Mowbray yeah. and Mary Wicks and a lot of people. You'd, you'd look at the, oh yeah, what's that person's name? You you would know, but a lot of people might not. But it's there is comforting to see, as you know, like I a bowl of oatmeal in the morning. Also, you know, is that era, um, and the character actor or actress uh, was uh, they were in all of these films. Uh, some that you'd see appear in all of them, or uh, from time to time. So that was always fun. I want to read an excerpt from your book, uh, which starts your book, and it says, Will Rogers had it, Marie Dresler and Wallace Beery had it, and now Marjorie Maine and Percy Kilbride and Ma and Pa Kettle seem to have it too. Uh, what is it? Well, it's hard to put your finger on it, but millions of movie patrons feel it, the, uh, at, uh, feel it in the minute that Ma and Pa Kettle appear on the screen. And with each new picture, added millions of kettle converts trek to the nation's theaters and bask in their indefinable something. So real, so warm, so human, it has become a part of the very heart and humor of America itself. And as I'm reading this, I'm thinking, well, that's a great start to this, but that was from an actual ad uh, that yes. ran uh, many years ago. And one of the things that really surprised me about this film, again, in your book, uh, is the popularity around the world that these films had. Well, it was unexpected. I think that people thought, um, Ma and Paul Kettle are so, such, uh, they're Americana, you know, and specifically like the, mm -hmm. they were based essentially, even though they were in Washington, you know, state, the, the actual people, the there was a sense of the kind of the, the Ozarks of the Missouri, uh, you know, the mountains, uh, Ozark Mountains, and uh, that influence. And I think that people thought this is too regional, it's too, it's too uh, raucous, it's too American, it's too slapstick. This kind of thing wouldn't necessarily go over in China or Australia or anything in Germany. They were hugely popular mm -hmm. all over the world and they would be dubbed into different languages and they would be the, and people would laugh at the same situations, which shows that it was not a strictly American concept. Mm -hmm. It was the idea of family. It was the idea of conflict. It was the idea of differences, uh, people who were different from each other, opposites attract and people who have to survive sometimes very difficult uh, situations economically or with other various crises that uh, the Kettle family would, would endure and overcome. And truly, I think that is a, a wonderful thing that everyone can relate to, everyone in the world. And I think that those films truly are universal in their appeal and take us now to the feel when they when the studio and all the powers that be uh on both sides of the footlights uh realized that this was time to to fold it in yeah well unfortunately um percy kilbride uh, because of his versatility in films uh, in on stage mm -hmm. specifically 
he really didn't do a lot of films and the films he did do, he tended to always be cast as the same kind of character. So typecast had he become because of his vivid portrayal of Paul Kettle, he really got tired of it. And also he was not in the best of health. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a heart condition and it, he found the films to be arduous to do, even though they doubled him quite a bit and try to, write as many scenes for him lying down or sitting down or whatever which fit his character ideally and he thought well i think i'm gonna hang it up and the studio said please don't my god you're a cash cow what would you like we'll give you a million dollars now can you imagine that'd be like saying 10 million dollars today exactly. offering this percy Gilbride a million dollars to stay in the series well he was so integrous he thought no i'm not doing it for that i'm i'm gonna leave and after a final film uh, which was mom Paul kettle at waikiki mm -hmm. he left although that one had been made prior to the uh, mom Paul kettle at home that was his, his last picture that he ever started mm -hmm. or appeared in in any way when he left of course there was talk that marjorie main was going to follow him because how do you have Paul kettle I mean, Ma Kettle without Paul Kettle. It'd be, be like thinking Stan Laurel without Oliver Hardy mm -hmm. or Abbott without Costello. I mean, it, something's wrong. It just doesn't work. So Paul Kettle was not in the series anymore. And they came up with an idea. Well, how about if we replace him with an actor by the name of Arthur Honeycutt, mm -hmm. an Academy Award nominee, uh, rustic characters, once again, stage trained. He was in the original company of Tobacco Road. He was a great actor and a um, fine, um, a fine substitute. But there's just no comparison mm -hmm. between Percy Kilbride and Marjorie Maine and their chemistry, and Arthur Honeycutt's and Marjorie Maine's. They just didn't. They didn't jibe. Mm -hmm. And after that, they thought, well, what are we going to do now? They still wanted to make pictures because they were still you know, raking in a million absolutely. bucks at the top. Yeah, absolutely. And so they hired an actor who, quite frankly, was ideal for the role, Parker Fennelly. He was an old radio star, had been on the Fred Allen show for years as Titus Moody. And he was very good in the film, but something indefinable made Marjorie Maine and Percy Kilbride a golden couple. It was just, it's it is, I, I say in the book, I struggled throughout the whole thing, my wife and I did, to explain why they were so great. And I don't know that we ever actually came up with that. I think we leave it to the reader's um, imagination and leave it to them to say, yes, this is what it is. These people go together like mashed potatoes and gravy, essentially. They were just perfect together. So the final two films are often overlooked mm -hmm. by fans of the series. But I think that those films have their appeal as well. And I think that people enjoy them. There's There was more to watch back in the 50s. Mm -hmm. There were more films being, oh, goodness, many more films being made. Uh, there was more interesting stuff on television than there is today. And there, was true, there were true entertainers, great character actors, great comedians, great singers. There was a lot to see then. You'd be hard pressed to find a lot of things today that would entertain an entire family. Mm -hmm. And that's what these films sought to do. Uh, they did it in an unpretentious manner and they were gloriously successful. I'm gonna show another clip and then I wanna talk about life beyond the series uh, as your book ends with that. So here it is. the folks. Howdy. <laughs> For a long time, Paul and I and the 12, 15 kids have wanted to thank you for the way you've received the kettle pictures. It's gratifying to know that we've been able to make you laugh and to forget your cares for a while. You know, once a year, 
along about springtime, we're liable to bust in on you, <laughs> uh, just like a spring tonic. I'm molasses and pour sulfur. <laughs> That's a good one, ain't it, Paul? <laughs> Howdy. Paul's in a conversational rut today. <laughs> but we're both excited about Universal International's new picture, Mom, Pa, Kettle on Vacation. I hope it'll work like a tonic for you. And remember, we're expecting to see you all in this theater when Mom, Pa, Kettle on Vacation plays here. Goodbye and good luck. Say goodbye to the folks, Paul. Howdy. Don't you love those trailers? I love them. I, they, they're so entertaining and they so evoke the film. And they're, I always, I have loved the way they do those. Those were, uh, generally speaking, those were reissued trailers. Um, these films, even though they might have played initially, let's say in 1951 or two, mm -hmm. they would be shown in theaters for 10 years or more. And very often what you would see as far as those trailers are concerned, would be reissue prints. And uh, the film stayed popular uh, in so many different capacities on television and uh, in movie theaters and also for kids uh, matinees. And that particular trailer that we just saw, uh, if it seemed stilted or awkward, it's for the simple reason that Bon and Paul Kettle obviously weren't together at that time. He had left mm -hmm. and they were forced to cut together a rather awkward bit with uh, Percy Kilbride taking off his hat, howdy, and then Marjorie Maine would react supposedly to him. That was a, the footage of him was from a movie that had been made a few years earlier. And Marjorie's of course was shot after Percy Kilbride had left the series. So they were still trying to get out of the, the, um, the films what they could box office wise. But what I love about this is that was enough. That was enough to get people to the theaters to see these films. Nowadays, a trailer goes on for 20 minutes and you feel like oh, you've loud seen, and loud. Uh, and you, uh, you feel like you've seen the entire film uh, by the time it gets to this point. I mean, the last time I went to the movie theater, there were like five of us in the movie theater. This was pre pandemic, of course. And I went to the management to complain about how loud it was. And they said they had no control over it. I, well, that's the way things are. I mean, it's, it's, a, I do like to go to, um, there's a movie theater across the street uh, from where we live in Lake Oswego. And I love this theater because it is one of the old fashioned, um, independent, uh, not a chain, not a, not a cineplex or any of those things that I detest, but an old fashioned movie theater. Oh. And I go over there and watch the contemporary films. And sometimes they will, when you walk in and they'll have on like a, a classic picture, you know, a black and white uh, Harold Lloyd film or a Frank Capra film or a, a universal horror. It's, and they just, they will play those until the, they go to the actual film. And because things are projected on disc today, Blu-ray or, they're done um, through, uh, I don't know how that's bounced off a satellite or something, but they, it's, it's very interesting to see these films projected on the big screen even now. Theaters have their place, but trailers, like you said, are very off-putting to me. Um, and these films, they thought, let's, well, let's make everybody laugh. It wasn't just for, for, for kids. It wasn't for, just for adults. It was literally for everyone. But and I think that's something that's missing. It's also the wholesomeness of uh, Marjorie Maine just talking to the audience. You know, here we are, folks. It's good to see you again. Yes. You notice in that she was also quite subdued as opposed mm -hmm. to her regular character. She was also wearing lipstick, I noticed when I saw it this time. Mm -hmm. And, of course, her character didn't wear any makeup at all. But I think it was something of a hybrid. It's like thinking I'm aware of the fact that, you know, I'm this character, but also... I'm an actress and I'm giving a little bit more of myself in that regard. I think that in itself is interesting, don't you? Absolutely. Now, yeah. I was still reading the book 
when the egg and I was on uh, the other night. And it's been years since I had seen the egg and I. And as I'm watching this film, and I, I felt like I was watching a black and white version uh, without the Hungarian accent, uh, uh, Green Acres. Uh, well, you're, yes, exactly. That's exactly what that is. There is, an, there is even a Mr. Haney character in this film. And yes. I'm glad that you do a whole chapter in the book about what they used to refer to as rural comedies. Um, uh, maybe, I mean, uh, the Andy Griffith show, uh, the Real McCoys, uh, Petticoat Junction, the Beverly Hillbillies, all of these shows uh, should you know, bow to where it began. They knew that audiences uh, would gravitate to that. Uh, in the early 1960s, uh, when this country was in such turmoil, Again, it was an escape. It was. I, I was a little kid um, when I think I was like three years old when Beverly Hillbillies debuted in 1962. I loved it from the minute I saw it. Mm -hmm. And I loved all those shows. Um, Mr. Haney, what was the name of the fellow who? Um, uh, Pat Buttram. Pat Buttram. Oh, yes, Pat Buttram, right, played Mr. Haney. But there was a fellow in the uh, film, Emery Parnell, played Billy. Um, I can't think of his name. I have, I, I have got the book here someplace. Billy who? Billy Reed. Thank mm -hmm. God for my wife. She is my memory at this Thank sad you, stage. In, <laughs> yes, at this stage in my decline, she is um, helping me by filling in whenever I can't remember my own name, and which happens on occasion, not that often. But, but still, Billy Reed, yes, he was the basis of the Mr. Haney character. And you're right. I mean, it all gets down to the fish out of water concept. Uh, Ava Gabor playing this city woman who didn't know one end of a, a pitchfork from the other. Her husband, who's clueless and doesn't know what he's doing and eccentric characters around. That is exactly the formula mm -hmm. for the egg and I. And it was a massive hit. I mean, people, th the critics, of course, thought those shows were dreck. They really did. They they thought it was the end of civilization as we know it, and that. Uh, and I remember teachers uh, not caring for things like the Bowery Boys or uh, Ma and Pa Kettle because they didn't always use good grammar. And you know, so if kids said "ain't," which was an absolutely, absolutely. verboten back in those days, it was. And you thought you don't talk like that. If I ever wanted to really get to my mother. I would use poor grammar or speak out of the side of my mouth or something. And she just thought, oh, you're, you're losing your refinement or whatever. People were really afraid of that. Mm -hmm. And the Mon Paul Kettle pictures, I think, represented, uh, for me, a little bit of the rebelliousness that uh, comes with youth. I love those pictures as far back as I can remember. I didn't know that they were connected to the Beverly Hillbillies or anything. That was simply a mm -hmm. genre of entertainment. That is the rustic comedy. And uh, it all started on television with Paul Henning, who of course was the creator of the Beverly Hillbillies, mm -hmm. Green Acres, uh, Petticoat Junction, all of those programs, not the real McCoys, but he was a writer on that show. And those programs were, they represented good family values to use a term I don't like, and they were funny and they were warm and they didn't give you bad dreams or uh, make you feel sickened by anything. I mean, it was it was just a, a comfortable, nice experience. I think we grew up, I know I'm older than you, but I think that we grew up in a time that was, <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I know, I know I am, but uh, it was, it, it is really a, it's a, it's a pleasant memory to look back. There was also just something about I think like the rustic nature of things that appealed to me as a kid. I I tried building Mon Pa Kettle's house in my backyard. Wow! And yeah, it wasn't good, but you know, <laughs> it, it. But like I was trying to build this basically a shack, and I thought this is you know my kettle house. And I think that stayed up for about a week before my mother took a broom to it or whatever, and it was gone. But uh, like I said, they, my parents weren't crazy about that kind of thing. They didn't. They didn't understand uh, the concept of Ma and Pa Kettle. They just thought they were low-class people 
The fact is they aren't. They are unrefined, certainly, but they're very decent people, very good people. They're altruistic. They make people feel welcome. They will help anyone who comes around. They're, they also, without preaching tolerance, their best friends were two Native Americans. And that is not something that you would see on the screen in those days. And they were just in the, everybody was, was welcome. Everyone was the same to them. And I think that's one of the reasons why people feel close to Ma and Pa Kettle, why they actually feel like they know them or they would love to know them. And I don't know, that's just, I guess that's, I'm letting a little too much about myself <laughs> talking about the old house that I built and everything, but it really was um, a great experience to be a kid and watch those pictures. And even now, uh, at my advanced age, I was able to, I, I hadn't seen the films in decades. And when I decided to do this, and I so I got the complete set, I think it was like eight or nine bucks mm -hmm. off of Amazon for all 10 pictures. And I watched each one um, with the um, closed captioning on so I could make sure the dialogue was right. And I watched them and I loved them. And my wife and I watched a couple together and we just had a good time with it. I'm, it was, sometimes you can watch something. Oh, it's terrible. You watch something from when you were a kid and think, how did I ever think this was funny? <laughs> you know, Mr. Ed or my favorite Martian or so many things, you know, you watch and think, my, I love American style. I don't know. You just, it, they were fun at the time. And they're still fun, but they don't necessarily affect you in the same way. You know, I, I said this at the beginning of my monologue, and I want to wrap it up there. Um, once again, Bill Maher did a wonderful monologue uh, the other night about uh, the 10 nominated Academy Award films. Uh, there's not one film in the list of films this year that is a joyous, family, happy-go-lucky film, which is really surprising that these films, for the most part, have come uh, out during uh, uh, the time of COVID. And the fact that so many people are dealing with so much angst in our lives right now, that uh, this escape is no longer there. Um, I want to thank you so much, uh, Lon, for reaching out to me um, to do this interview. Um, it's always a pleasure sitting with you, and you always have a, a spot on this show. Um, it forced me to go back and look at these films. Uh, once I got the book and I started looking at these films, and thank you, Turner Classic Movies, uh, for showing these films and giving us a chance to escape. So not only can you escape uh, by going to see these films, but you've got this great, great book. Um, I hope that everyone will read this book. It's a lot of fun. It's a great read, and it's a great reference book. Uh, you know, with uh, each person, uh, not only on camera, but behind the scenes, uh, running a studio at that time, uh, getting a film produced, and scripts, and all that it takes to make a great film. It's all in this book, and I highly recommend it. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. We are at the end of our show. Um, if you enjoyed today's show, and I hope you did, please, please, please leave a comment on YouTube. Uh, hit the like button. And if you're not a subscriber already, please subscribe to my channel. Uh, my goal, my dream is to celebrate artists and their body of worth. I always end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything return. What I'd like you to do now is I'd like you to go to Amazon.com or your favorite bookseller, and I want you to order two copies of this book. Keep one for yourself and send one to, let's say, your third friend that pops up on Facebook. Uh, just let them know what they mean to you. As my dear friend David Friedman says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. I also want to let you know that if you are around tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock, I will be celebrating Deborah Stone, Singer, actress, former dancer, showgirl, and drag queen. You have to watch the show to find out what that means. <laughs> uh, but anyway, Lon, I'm going to give you the final word. First of all, thank you for Deborah as well. Anything that you want to say about anything that we talked about today that you want to expound upon, 
anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any message that you want to put out to everyone who's watching now. And thank you for all that you do because we need you. I would like to talk about you as a matter of fact, Richard. I um, have done a lot of these podcasts and whatnot. I don't think I've ever dealt with anyone who was as professional, as prepared, as cordial, and simply as good as you are. I really appreciate your ability to bring people out in a conversation. My goodness, I'm usually so shy, as you can imagine, and you made me feel comfortable here. You made me feel comfortable with the, the technical end of things, which is a miracle in itself. I really am great, grateful that uh, I've made your acquaintance, that Rick and I know you. We've got more projects coming up, and we would be honored, either Rick and me, or just me, or just Rick, coming on your program again and, and Deborah, uh, spending time with you. I want and Deborah to join us. I would love to. Deborah is not a fan of uh, interviews. Uh, she just... She's a, a marvelous person, incredibly well-spoken and a br you know, brilliant public speaker, although you couldn't get her up in front of uh, <laughs> anyone in a phone booth today. I, I mean, she just, <laughs> yes. I mean, so I've got enough ham in, in me, I guess, for the whole family. But seriously, I really thank you, Richard, for making this such a pleasant experience. And I think you've got some very, very lucky uh, listeners and followers. I really do. That means the world to me. It truly really does. So thank you so much. Make it a great uh, day tomorrow. And tonight, go and watch a Mon Pa Kettle film. You'll see <laughs> both of us. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so Bye. much, Richard. Bye-bye.